discloses sexual abuse to the daycare provider and to myself. And I'm in, you know, I'm in, I'm in shock. I, it's like I would wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning. That would just shoot me straight out of the bed. And I, I could still see that scene of him bringing her down the stairs like that and thinking, my God, he's doing it right in front of my face. And I didn't even get it. I thought she actually got sick. Can you imagine? Because we didn't hear about sexual abuse back then. And, and so um, it was just like I, he had that smirk on his face like of O.J. Simpson, like, I just raped your daughter and you don't even get it. So in the meantime, um, my daughter discloses. My sister is a nurse at Children's Hospital, and, and I asked her, I said, what she's told me and what should I do? She says, take her to her pediatrician in the morning. I first ask her what happened down there, and if she repeats the same thing, take her to her pediatrician. But don't mention her dad's name, just see if she repeats the same thing, and then take her. So that's what I did, and that's when social services gets involved, and this is where my nightmare begins, and a lot of these cases it does. So I'm... Um, Social services is involved, and the, um, they have a psychologist on the case. And the psychologist, after about five sessions, comes out of a session with my daughter and said, yes, she has been sexually abused, and she's been exposed to sexual stimuli. She's two and a half years old. And it was just like, how I, you, you, the feeling of a mother or anybody with their child to hear that, even though you know it's going on at this point, to hear that professional tell you, yes, yes, it is going on. And then... I take her to social services for a visit with her father, which was a minimal, he had um, supervised visits for a very short time. And as I walk in, I'm looking through this glass window and I see him in there with my daughter, and he's the perfect dad, I promise. I, you look at him, he's intelligent, he's charismatic, he's charming, he's good looking, and he wasn't the boogeyman behind the bushes. He wasn't hiding out, grabbing this child. And, I, and I'm looking at that and going, wow, this is gonna be, Hard, but the bottom line is my daughter's very articulate. She's been talking spontaneously and told lots of people what's happening to her. And I've got a psychology report stating abuse, and a babysitter who spends all her time with her stating there's abuse. So, you know, they're going to listen to the child. That's my first, absolutely, they'll listen to the child. So, that day I met by a GAL, guardian of Leiden for the child, lawyer for the child, which, um, if you don't know, and I didn't at the time. And she meets me with disdain. I mean, just almost pure hatred the first time she's met me. And I'm thinking, I'm holding back and looking at her. And she says, she says, I have four things I want to discuss with you. And I want you to go into social, with social services. They have a conference room and discuss these four things. And I think, well, I can deal with this. I've dealt with a lot up to this point, And I can deal with these people. Well, that was a mistake. I go in, and they interrogated me like I'd never even seen on TV before in law and order movies. I mean, just... Why would your daughter continue to say this if you weren't coaching her? Because maybe it's going on. And then the next question would be, I'm going to have you do a psychological evaluation. I'm going to have him do a psychological evaluation. Good. Then maybe we'll get to the bottom of this. And maybe we'll find out about you. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is bad. And then the next thing was, I want you to do separation counseling. And I'm thinking, separation counseling? I mean, I have spent two years of my life getting away from this man. He stalked me. He called me 12 times a day at work. He's never left me alone. And now you're going to have me go sit in the same room with him and he's, you know, abusing my, our, ch our child. I, 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 I was thinking to myself, I didn't say this to her. This is all I'm thinking of. This is nuts. And then the next thing was, I said, well, what about Dr. Baker's report? And she looks at me, she says, Dr. Baker's report does not state there's any abuse. And I think, am I going crazy? I mean, I just read the report and she just came out and told me, yes, your daughter's being abused. I said, have you met with a babysitter who's been in my child's life? She hadn't even met with a babysitter. She never met me. She'd been on the case for three months. That's where I say these people go behind the scenes, these sociopaths, and they manipulate the court system while you're sitting there trying to protect your child. And I, and then she says, this is parental alienation syndrome. And I'm like, parental alienation? I said, I've been over backwards for this man to be in her life. I had a great relationship with my own father, and I want her to have a chance to have the same. And then she says, this child's going into foster care. And I've never been away from my baby. I mean, she's my life. I'm the sole caretaker. I go into another room, and I sit down, and I'll still cry to even tell this story today. I laid my head on a desk, and I cried like somebody just ripped my heart and soul out of me. And the social worker comes up to me coldly and taps me on the shoulder and says, you can go say goodbye to your daughter now. And I got up, and it was a gray mist around me. And my legs were quivering. I couldn't feel them. I, I, I know I was in shock. And I could hear them in the background going, look at her. Look at her. She can't handle it. She can't say goodbye to her daughter. 
And I just kind of put my arm out to the side and I said, oh yes, I can, because I wanted to make sure that my baby knew I wasn't going to be there and at least to say goodbye to her because I didn't know what was going to happen. So I go to say goodbye to her, hold it together, get the tears marked, moved away, and they had the police escort me out that day. She's now placed in foster care, and I'm, um, I've, I've driven to the psychologist's office that stated she was being abused, and, um, and she said, my God, I had an idea they'd do something like this, and I told them, absolutely not. So I'm looking out of the city of Denver, Colorado, the lights, and I'm wondering where my baby is. Who has her? What does she think is going on? What is going to happen? And she's doing so poorly in that foster care home that they remove her from that foster care home and put her in with her daycare provider, who is also a foster care parent, and which was a good move because at least it was with somebody she knew. And at that point, my daughter's waking in the night screaming out. She'd be arching her back six inches off the bed screaming out, no, daddy, don't, owie, owie, it's bad. Five and six times a night, you're up with her. I knew this because I had done it the previous three months. And I begged social services, just come witness what my child goes through in a night. I'll pay you, just, just you have to see this. And obviously they couldn't do that, but um, the daycare provider is going through this. And then my daughter is displaying sexual behaviors with another little boy at the daycare in a playhouse and, and wanting him to do stick it here, behavioral things, and she says, You've got to do something with what this baby's going through, you know. And they said, well, we're going to put her in another foster home. She says, you do that, you will kill this baby. She needs her mommy. So they put her back in my home. But under the pretense with lots of these mothers, they put the child back in your home, but you're kind of told, don't bring up the abuse again. Do not mention it. Keep it under wraps, or you're going to lose your child again. You've been threatened now. So um, during this time, more evidence is coming out on abuse, and I have I have a, I, a one night that I, it's a long story, so I'm not going to go into it. But I pick my daughter up, and I put a voice-activated tape recorder by her bed at night to record those cries. And on this time, she tells in detail what her dad's doing to her, and a police detective comes in to investigate the next day. And I knew that I could possibly lose my child for bringing any kind of police or anything like that, but I had to do what was right by her. And this policeman comes in, and within 15 minutes, and I believe the police need to investigate these cases, he came in, and 15 minutes, my daughter told him more stuff than she'd ever told me in detail. And it took a, a diagram of a male child and a female child, or a, a male, and, and then a female, and he said, did anyone ever touch her way made her feel funny or uncomfortable? My daddy did. Where does he touch you? My pee, -pee my bottom. What is he touching you with? It's red, and it's hard, and it hurts. And she called it a peanut. And what she discussed the night before with me was in more detail. So I thought she was talking about food. She's talking about a peanut. Long story, she ends up drawing on the diagram. She's three years old. Circles the anal area and the vagina, and then turns around and says, circles the red around the penis of where she'd been touched and what with. And there's a lot more information in that. He tells me he's going to have the DA involved, and this was going to be a long uphill battle against social services. But I didn't know what I was in for even yet. So um, I have a hearing coming up, and that detective does come in to testify. Um, I have the daycare provider, the psychologist at stage who's being abused. All this information comes out in this hearing, but the judge ignores it all. They, they won't allow, they don't listen to the evidence. And instead, in the best interest of the child, the father was more able to nurture the relationship with the mother and child than the mother was able to nurture that relationship with the father and child, and I lost custody. I remain with 50% visitation. Just recently in Colorado, we had Senate Bill 129 that a lot of us fought desperately to not let that get passed. It's more of a father's rights bill. What it does is automatically has these judges be able to give 50% to the parents. When you're in a contested custody case, most of these cases are abuse cases. So you do not want that person to get 50% of the time off the bat. The day that that judge handed my ex or the father 50% of the a time with her and, and sole decision-making power, he handed me to him on a silver platter. Now that man has that coercion and control. The very thing he always wanted was now just handed to him. The abuse continues. I have two new attorneys to appeal everything that ha happened, and the abuse continues, and there's more evidence that's coming out. My daughter has a severe discharge. I mean severe. And she's in pain. And if I take her to the doctor, I'm going to lose her. But it's a catch-22. You either take this child you're legally responsible to, or you don't, and, and you're not protecting that child. 
but you may lose her. So I have these new attorneys. They said, well, Marilee, you've got to take her. And I called the, the previous policeman. He said, take her to Humana Hospital to the emergency room the next time you come up with this, that she comes up and she's in pain like this. And I did. And at that point, my daughter had physical evidence. Now she has lacerations on the inside, abrasions, eight millimeter opening, and is returned to her father within a day. She used to say to me, Mommy, has it stopped? Have you stopped it? And I'd say, yeah, I think I have. Oh, I dread ever saying those words to her. So what I did now is um, I'm, I'm geared. I'm going. I, I've testified before Congress. There's a mom that will be here tomorrow, protected mom, Dr. Amy Newstein, who set up a congressional hearing in New York when we testified before Congress. There was about 10 mothers from across the nation. Now, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have a way to connect the way you guys do here today. But after I spoke at that congressional hearing, I thought I was all alone in this. And I was with 10 other mothers that had, could have been me speaking. So I realized I wasn't alone. That empowers you. So that's the huge empower we have here. These kind of conferences gives these women empowerment. So I end up um, getting a lot of uh, documentation. That's what I was telling you is I got a big black binder, legal binder, and I put all my court documents, only the important ones, pertinent ones, not a bunch of nonsense. You want to get right to the direct line. Because once I did that, I knew my case better than anybody. And you are your child's own best advocate. So you need to have everything documented and ready to go and in, and in order so your ducks are all in, uh, in a row. And at, at that point, I would go to the DA, the Kemp Center, the governor of Colorado. I, I mean, Kemp Center was a national section of sexual abuse center in Colorado. And I was working every avenue I could work to free my child. And then I um, started lobbying in Washington, D.C. And uh, there's, I now, by this point, I have three police reports, three doctor's reports, hospital reports from the top doctors in the state of Colorado saying my child's being abused. And the judge on the case is sitting on the case doing nothing. He will do nothing. I start lobbying in Washington, D.C. with a huge law firm in Washington. It was called Bernard Lipfer, Lipfer McPherson in hand. And um, they would set my appointments on the heel. And the reason I was able to do that is because I was in management with the airlines. I went back to flying to free up my time. So that way I could work this as a full-time job. So I would fly to Washington, D.C. And I'd go to the law firm, and then they'd set my appointments up on the heel. I'd lobby all day, come back, put my uniform on, and go back to work. On this one occasion, I'm, I'm at the airport. I'm, I've just, got, just finished lobbying. And I call my attorneys, and I get on the phone, and they, and the paralegal's like, high-pitched voice, she's going, Merrily, Merrily, there is, there's an emergency hearing right now in your case, and they're taking your daughter away from you. I said, what? They can't do this. I'm not even present. I'm not even in the state. How can they do this? She said, Merrily, they're taking your daughter away from me. I have to go. And, and, and I said, you tell my attorneys not to take that phone call. I'm not even present. She goes, Merrily, it's a judge. They have to take the call. And I knew that moment I'd lost my baby after all this. And I... Um, went and got on the airplane, and when I got into the lavatory, when those engines roared, I promise you, I roared like a lion all the way home. So now I'm having to, I have supervised visits one hour a week. Now I had supervised visits one hour a week for eight years. I, I got moved to two, by the way, but I was treated as a hardened criminal. Your criminals do not go through the supervision that I went through. So I'm meeting with the DA during this time and trying to get him to help. And I go in to meet with the DA, and I have my attorney with me this day. And I have um, I decided maybe it's the way I look, you know, that I'm not credible because the way I look. So I'm going to wear a man's gray Pendleton suit, you know, and a starchy white shirt and a little narrow black tie and slip my hair back. And I'm going to be like a guy. And maybe they'll listen to me. See, I knew what gender bias was. I didn't know, but obviously I was picking up on it. And I go into the DA's office, and I'm going through the metal detectors, and I set them off. And I go, oh, and I have my attorney with me. He doesn't know I'm wired. I go, oh, it must be my wire under my bra. And joke around about it and get through the metal detector. Of course, I wired the DA that day. I had it all on tape, and he believed. I said, Gallagher, look at this case. Look at this notebook. I said, you have one-tenth of evidence in cases that you prosecute. You can prosecute this case. Why are you not prosecuting the case? He said, merely. I believe your child's being abused. But let's, let's see what Judge Michael Beatty does. And if he takes that child away from you, we will step in and do something. And he never did. 
and I did lose my child completely. And on Beta's order, I go in, it's all of a sudden they have this, he has this order that he wants to read, and normally, your, the mothers are on one side of the courtroom and all the professionals are on the other side, and you're kind of there by yourself. And I'm with my attorney this day, and, and my case was a sexual assault case, although the courts of Colorado stated there was no sexual abuse in this case, when they had files in those days, every file in my case, which we're talking hundreds, because I went through this for 10 years, were stamped sexual assault letters, sexual assault case, sexual assault case. However, there's no sexual abuse in this case. Three minutes, oh shoot, I'm gonna have to cut this. So anyway, I end up, um, he ends up, uh, oh, I'm losing it. <laughs> well, anyway, I lose, I, the DAs, I have all that information on tape, and then um, I have a rally at the Capitol, and this is the one thing I just wanna get out is, I'm gonna skip a bunch of stuff here, but during this time, I met with Joan Pennington, who was an attorney in this, and she was the guru in all this, and I wanna give her all the credit for what's happened here today and how this has moved forward, because she was a domestic violence survivor. The father, her husband had beat her in one eye until it went blind, and then he started her other eye, and she would sit on the Capitol steps in New Jersey with her five kids and ask for help. She went to law school, she kept getting cases and calls from mothers like myself, and she thought they were crazy. And we decided to put this rally together at the Capitol. And when we did, it was incredible, incredible grassroots effort. And we had attorneys coming in from across the nation that were very big in this. So it was like Alan Rosenfeld and Garnet Harrison. And, and she had uh, Louise Armstrong, who is uh, the author of Kiss Daddy Goodnight. And she's one of the biggest first feminists in this. And Gloria Steinem read a letter. And she had, we had musicians. and. I had speakers in the trees, and it was an incredible rally, and the mothers that came in from every state were there, and the speeches were incredible. And what I want to say is, Joan said, at first we took a list of the mothers going through this, and we realized that we need to take a list of judges, and today we're going to start taking a list of those judges, and the first judge on that list is going to be that of Marilyn McLean's judge who sentenced her child to a lifetime of abuse, and this is for you, Amy, and her fist goes in the air. And then she said, this is like... You know, we, I had every media station there, so I had lots of media coverage. And when she says, this is like the Civil Rights Act of the 60s, this is the movement of the 90s. We're in 2015, where are we? And, and she said, you know, it, it's taken them 20 years to listen to domestic violence. We do not have another 20 years for them to listen to this issue. Look where we are. We're still trying to get people to listen to this issue. And when I got up to speak, I, I hadn't really planned a speech because I was so busy planning the rally. But I, um, when I first started speaking, was at a law school, and I was real shy, soft, nice voice. And by the time you heard me at this speech, you would not know I was the same woman. <laughs> I was passionate. I, my voice was so strong that it was guttural. I mean, you, you could hear, I, I said, why are women going to jail? Why is a protective parent being punished? Why are mothers going into the underground? I know the answers to these whys. The pain is unbearable. For God to take your child away can in time be accepted as the will of God. For the laws, social services, and perpetrators to do the same is the will of the system. And you know, and, and a mother's first instinct is to protect her child, and when the means and power to do this are stripped unjustly from a mother, there are no words that can describe the constant heartache that is felt as each day passes by. Our children's dreams have turned into screams, and their prayers into fears. It is time to listen to the children. And one mother after another after another, and it was just a really great um, rally. And so I just wanted to go on to Joan, and my main thing is, is I, I think the moms need to get to the media, and that's kind of what I discussed last night. We've got incredible work going on. We've got so many people doing the right thing. We've got Barry Goldstein's book, Moe's. Um, my book, I didn't even mention my book. My book is an educational tool for this, for moms to, to educate judges and lawyers. This is a case study. I'm not doing this out here to make money. This is my passion. I want to see a difference. So that book can be utilized to give to people, to educate them on what's happening, to show, because it gives the research and the legal behind it. You've got um, Stop Abuse. You've got CPPA, California Protective Parents Association, with Connie Valentine. have been working on this for years. And she, legislation with Kathy, Kathleen Russell. You've got Mothers of Lost Children. We have the organizations out there, and I believe we need to put an umbrella over all those organizations, and we all need to go to the media at the same time, because this is smoldering under our feet. And until we get to the media, until people get educated out there of what's happening, they aren't hearing us. They're not going to hear this. 
So that's my avenue. God bless the moms and the children out here and for the safety of them, and God bless all of you, and thank you for coming.